Okay, good morning, everybody, one more time. It's really pleasure and honor for us to see so many of you here with competing session and many other activities you could probably perform this morning. Um, I'm pleased to welcome you at the session uh, dedicated to artificial intelligence in cultural institutions. As you are all well aware, uh, artificial intelligence is taking our world by a storm. When you are searching internet using Google, for example, what you get is not the search result, but actually recommendation prepared to you by the artificial intelligence, right? Artificial intelligence is running stock exchanges, uh, the currency trade. It's, uh, it's used in, in analysis of many fields. Just recent application, uh, the results of the computer tomography scan can be analyzed by artificial intelligence and it's far more efficient in detecting cancer than the trained doctors. So it's all over here and it's winning our world. Uh, so our question for today is why not include it into the world of uh, cultural institutions, into art activities? Should we do that? Should we avoid it? Or maybe it's all too late because it's already here to stay. Uh, we'll have this chance of discussion uh, with our experts from many countries. I would like to make a brief introduction, starting with uh, Barbara Thiele from the um, Jewish Museum in Berlin. Barbara is the head of digital and publishing at this museum, so she's responsible for all the digital activities held at the museum, and she's of course you know, scanning the world, what's going on, including the, the AI. Uh, Tony Gillian, Tony Gillan is our next expert. Expert, please wave, Tony, so we can recognize you. Tony is currently working um, for the Imperial War Museum, but previously he spent a number of years at Tate, and he was producing and curating projects, uh, digital projects, and including projects with um, also AI, especially the famous Ikai Prize for digital innovation. Uh, and also the, the recent winner of this competition, the Recognition Project, a program involving AI. I'm a bit scary, how will you mix the you know, AI and the war topics at your current position? It might be quite dangerous. Okay. Uh, Shimon Yanota is our uh, next panelist. Please wave, Shimon. Okay. Uh, Shimon is uh, from the Future Processing Company. It's the official partner of the conference, and it's actually software uh, developing company, so they are dealing with the AI on a daily basis. Uh, Jonathan Knott is our next uh, panelist. Okay. Uh, Jonathan is a journalist and writer. He specializes in the field of digital technology in museums. He's currently a staff writer for Museum Journal, but you can also read his articles on The Guardian and The Telegraph. And um, last but not least, we have uh, Jakub Kuźniewski with us. Uh, Jakub is co-founder of Pan Generator. It's a group um, operating in a field somewhere in the crossroad of, of design, uh, art, uh, new technologies. Um, so um, Jakub's group uh, clients are a cultural institution and commercial institution, but they also do the pure art. So, as you see, we have a broad scope of perspective and uh, uh, many, many possible viewpoints. Uh, me, myself, I'm Piotr Kosobutski. I'm a science journalist and science educator. Uh, so I'm you know, involved from the scientific part in this topic and will be your facilitator during this conference. Okay, so briefly how our session will look like. We'll start a brief introductory speeches uh, by each of the panelists, then we'll have some discussion, there will be time for you to ask your questions, and then we'll make some brief wrap-up and some our, our session. Is this program okay with you? Yep? Okay. All right, thank you very much. So, we will start with a brief introduction, maximum five minutes per panelist, okay? I will be keeping your time straight. So, one minute before the end of your time, you will have a warning like this. And when the time comes up, you'll hear it clearly, okay? It's some analog timekeeping device, but it works perfectly. Okay, so maybe we will start um, with Tony, okay? The time starts and the floor is yours. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yeah, that works fine. 
So I'm Tony Gillen, and I'm uh, currently Senior Producer of Public Engagement and Learning at the Imperial War Museums in London, which is a group of five uh, museums and historic sites um, that uh, explore the history uh, of uh, recent conflicts from the First World War to today. Um, I used to run a project called the IK Prize at Tate, uh, which was set up four, nearly five years ago as an innov innovation platform. It was a prize for uh, digital innovation, looking for ideas uh, that would explore new technologies and ways we can engage audiences online in the galleries with Tate's uh, collection uh, of uh, modern and contemporary art. Um, I suppose the reason why I've been invited is a project that won the 2016 prize recognition by a design company called Fabrica. You may have heard of them. They're a famous design uh, and technology company based in uh, Italy. They uh, developed a project called Recognition in partnership with Tate and Microsoft. Recognition was a uh, software program that lived online, so to speak. It lived online and in an installation at Tate Britain. Its sole purpose in life was to continually search and better understand Tate's vast collection of art and try and find images in up-to-the-minute news that it thought were relevant to that image. So it used several different algorithms. It used a composition analysis algorithm, looking for patterns, shapes, um, textual similarities. It used object recognition, so a form of machine learning, where it processed um, uh, the whole collection and tried to categorize the objects it saw, whether it saw a teacup, whether it saw a face, whether it saw an anorak, a, a light bulb and trying to find similar objects. It also uh, used facial recognition, so it tr tried to find human faces and tried to understand whether these faces were happy or sad. And the interesting thing about this project is a lot of these um, APIs have existed for a long time, these tools. But what's interesting about artificial intelligence is really that's just a word for a very vast um, group of technologies and uh, processes that each individually mimic or seem to do something that a human can do. So facial recognition, humans can all look and say, that's a woman, that's a man, or that's a, a nose, or that's yellow, that's red. But humans can also move, humans can also listen. The difficult thing is to join those things up. So what recognition did is it asked the question, how do humans see? How do we put together all the, the, the multiple different things that we can see and formulate that into a, an understanding? So what recognition did over three months is it continually scanned the collection and looked into up-to-the-minute news and tried to find images based across all of these uh, different criteria and it posted them on social media. Um, from a point of engagement, it was about trying to insert our vast collection into uh, the, the media landscape. One of the big problems, as uh, we all know with museums, is once you digitize a really vast collection, you just repeating the problem you have in gallery. Museums are full of a lot of shit, and when you put a lot of shit online, it's just more shit for people to get lost in. This was a way of, a, a kind of creative and interesting search tool uh, to, yeah, m m an interesting way to organize that collection. So um, the, the project's now uh, switched off. The AI does no, no, no longer lives, but there is a really interesting um, archive of, of its work online, so I encourage you all to have a look through recognition tate.org.uk, uh, and you can search through the, the, the matches and the archive of, of, of um, image matches that it, that it made. Um, as my closing remark, I suppose I'll, I'll just pick up on what I think. That was a really interesting project, and I learned a lot, because I must, hands up, I'm not an expert on AI. I learned a lot going through that process, um, and it was incredibly interesting. It taught me a lot about what AI can do, what it can't do, what it might be able to do, how, what it might be able to help us with in museums. I thought it will certainly help us organize, uh, improve our search. I'm sure you all know what search is such a problem when you have a huge collection. Um, but in my new job at Imperial War Museums, I spend most of my time thinking about how do we tell stories as well as organize the collection. And I think uh, the opportunity to tell, to create immersive experience, interactive experiences, and genuinely interactive and personalized stories, whether they be online or as part of exhibitions, I think that's what's really exciting about the potential of AI for the future. That's everything from me. All right, thank you. Thank you, Tony. Okay, Jonathan. Okay. Um, is that okay? My experience of AI within cultural institutions is writing about it for museums journal. Um, from the projects I'm aware of, it's clear that the use of AI in these institutions is at an early stage. Um, but it's also clear that the technology has a lot of potential 
to support the work of cultural institutions, particularly in analyzing data on their collections and audiences. Um, I'm a bit more skeptical about both the possibility and the desirability of using AI for tasks that currently require more human judgment, uh, whether that's creative judgment or moral judgment. Um, when people talk about AI in cultural institutions, they're usually referring to machine learning, um, which is when an algorithm can be trained to make informed guesses based on past data, um, powers things like Google's predictive search function. Um, functions based on machine learning, like image, language, and text recognition, could potentially bring a lot of value to cultural institutions by helping them enhance, manage, and understand information about their collections. Um, the British Library has been experimenting with using text recognition, for example, to automatically transcribe handwritten records. There's also been some very interesting work by researchers at Rutgers University in the US on using <coughs> image recognition to classify paintings. In a study for a 2015 paper, their approach identified the right artist in more than 60% of the paintings it was provided with and the style in 45%. As well as managing collections data, that kind of functionality might also help with tasks like art historical interpretation and identifying fraud. Another area where AI could be of use to cultural institutions is helping them manage their marketing and operations more effectively. It could help them analyze visitor data, for example, to help develop things like dynamic exhibition pricing. And language recognition can also be used to develop new ways of engaging with audiences. The Anne Frank House in Amsterdam uses a chatbot on the Messenger app to provide people with information on the museum and on Anne Frank. And the Forever Project, which is led by the UK's National Holocaust Centre and Museum, has filmed Holocaust survivors answering thousands of commonly asked questions, and this enables people to virtually interact with them to learn about their experiences. All of these projects are fairly experimental, but there's clearly a broad range of possible uses for AI in cultural institutions, and the power of the technology will increase as machine learning evolves into deep learning, uh, a more advanced type of machine learning that requires less human oversight. But if cultural institutions want to move from potential to reality with AI, there are important issues that need to be addressed. Um, one is to do with sharing data. In terms of audience data, they don't have the resources of, of people like Google and Facebook. And in terms of collections data, uh, related objects are often held by separate institutions. Um, so in order to develop effective algorithms, institutions may have to become more comfortable sharing operational data and collections data, and that would mean overcoming both technical and political challenges. Another issue is financial resources. Uh, these obviously aren't something that cultural institutions usually have much of. Funders and institutions tend to like big capital projects, and it's hard to get money for digital initiatives, which often generate less prestige and develop in less predictable ways. Um, I think there are also some more fundamental problems concerning AI itself. Um, it's pretty good at data analysis, but I'm not sure we can assume it will do equally well at more sophisticated tasks. Um, there's a big difference between writing a routine sports report and carrying out investigative journalism. And in the same way, there's also a big difference between identifying a painter of an artwork correctly and curating an exhibition. <laughs> the, the algorithm created at Rutgers University could identify the right artist 60% of the time, but that's still significantly worse than a human curator would perform. Um, and that's only one small part of what a curator does. Um, so there's clearly a long way to go regarding the capabilities of AI. And the growth of AI also raises important ethical issues. Um, algorithms are des designed by humans and they're liable to reproduce society's existing biases in areas like gender and race, for example. In the US, um, the Human Rights Data Analysis Group has argued that predictive policing algorithms reflect and may even worsen existing biases because they're based on databases of crime already known to police. Um, so I think it's, it's likely that forms of AI will play a bigger part in the work of cultural institutions over the coming years. Um, but as AI becomes more deeply embedded in our society, I think there's an equally important role they can play and that's encouraging people to explore, understand, and find ways of addressing the ethical issues that AI raises. Thank you, Jonathan, for this broad perspective. And now, uh, Jakub. Hello. Um, so, I was, as I was introduced already, um, I'm a part of a Pan Generator Collective, and uh, we're basically doing um, new media art um, uh, for uh, our own, uh, but also for um, Institution, uh, cultural institutions and, and, and commercial brands. Uh, so we were always like in between uh, a world of like commercial, what's commercial, what's art, what's design, uh, what is technology, and what is art. Um, some always somewhere in, in, in between. Um, 
Uh, and uh, we've done a couple of projects for museums, for example, uh, for Warsaw Rising Museum uh, here in Warsaw, and also uh, Pauline Museum uh, um, here. Um, and uh, we always uh, mm, try to uh, recreate a tangible experience for the audience. Uh, so uh, we are very much interested in like connecting, you know, bits and atoms together, uh, because we strongly believe that. Um, you know, uh, obviously, you could have like a museum in your pocket, right, uh, or on your computer screen. Uh, but uh, given that uh, we are, you know, that that's, you know, the, those screens are such commodity right now, uh, it doesn't make sense to put most screens into the museums. For example, we are very against, you know, uh, all those touch screens in the museums. You know, it's like just over the top, I guess. Uh, so we try to try kind of create really kind of unique uh, site-specific experiences for the audience, uh, where they can really kind of touch and feel uh, and experience, um, you know, uh, interaction and, and some information uh, in a unique way. So that's basically our approach. Uh, but recently, we kind of like try, trying to jump into this AI bandwagon as, as everyone uh, else. Um, uh, but uh, I guess we, we, we just try to, um, you know, uh, deploy like more critical approach here. So uh, as some uh, topics were brought already, uh, like, you know, those biases in AI, I think that that's a big topic that needs to uh, be uh, uh, talked ab about uh, in, in more like general public, because the general public is kind of not aware what AI really is and what are, you know, uh, uh, problems with that. Uh, so for example, people are very much convinced that algorithms are absolutely uh, inert and uh, objective tools. Uh, uh, but they're not. Uh, they, they, they're mostly like just, you know, uh, made in our own image and then they can mirror the worst of ourselves. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, some biases uh, in those algorithms might be a problem. Uh, for example, right now I'm, I'm working on a project called uh, The Beholder, which is kind of, uh, um, and basically it's an art piece that's uh, judging the uh, aesthetics of the viewer. So like just reversing this uh, normal like uh, vector of like uh, aesthetic judgment where you know the audience is judging if art is uh, nice or not. Uh, but here we have like this opposite situation. Uh, and um, I, I achieved this uh, in, in a way that I, I trained uh, uh, a model of my aesthetic preferences uh, and it's absolutely subjective. So it's, it's like totally subjective model of what I perceive as a beautiful person or, or not. Uh, and and uh, then, uh, you know, uh, it's embodied in this uh, art frame and then screen and the camera and, and uh, you know, the, the audience is like standing in front of this uh, picture and is being judged by their aesthetic qualities. Uh, kind of by me, but it's not me, because that's a model of my aesthetics, you know, it's complicated, and that, but that's interesting. And also, I, I guess that that's, that's uh, the main theme that I'm currently interested in, is like um, artificial intelligence and aesthetics. Um, also, another interesting question is, uh, can we create like uh, uh, aesthetics that are totally separate from the human aesthetics? Could they be synthesized? Uh, could machines create, you know, their own tastes? totally uh, different from our own and what implications might be, you know, so I guess I just like uh, um, uh, want to, to talk about uh, AI uh, in more like artistic uh, fashion today. Thank you. Thank you, Jakub. And now Barbara. Hello, everyone. Um, as Piotr already introduced me, I'm the head of pub digital and publishing in the Jewish Museum Berlin, quite big Jewish museum. Um, some of you might know the Pauline Museum here. I think uh, the Jewish Museum Berlin and the Pauline Museum are the, like, the biggest Jewish museums in Europe. And um, before I joined the museum last year, I was uh, managing director of a digital startup, um, a self-publishing platform to be precise. Um, and then I joined the museum and together with my team of 16 colleagues, we are responsible for the digital strategy of the museum. So we implement media guides, media stations and our exhibitions. Um, we are uh, responsible for our website, social media channels, databases and the print and online publications. And um, since its foundation um, in 2001, the Jewish Museum Berlin was I would say quite progressive always uh, concerning new technology. Um, we experimented quite early with multimedia presentations, um, online games, apps, and so on. And um, right now we are in the process of developing an, a participative online platform um, where 
the general public can add and correct information about German Jews and Jews in Germany. And this is something I would like to ask the experts here if this is something where we can, where AI can help us because um, uh, you can imagine if um, a platform like that in the Jewish context is open for everyone, we are also kind of scared of anti-Semitic attacks and something like that. So we can use bots to, to go through um, to go through the texts, or at least that is my hope. Um, and um, also in the future, of course, we want to use technology and want to try out technology. Um, but what is very important for me to say, we don't want to use technology for technology's sake. Um, we always, our objectives are and remain preserving, collecting, researching, and displaying objects, stories, as Tony said, and information about German Jews and Jews in Germany. So we're always interested in the story and technology. With this in mind, we can exploit technology to help us achieve our goals, but not the other way around. And regarding artificial intelligence, um, we are really at the beginning. If Tony says he's not an expert, I'm an absolutely beginner. <laughs> but. Um, we are redesigning our permanent exhibition right now. We will reopen in 2019. And in this context, we are testing, or we are intending to test artificial intelligence to sort out parts of our collection. And we hope that this might make it easier for people to access our works. Or we might also just use it as a tool for our um, curators to, um, to comb through the thousands of documents and photographs in our care. Um, so our curators um, can more easily decide which objects to um, display. We are also um, building a brand new media guide where we might use machine learning to be able to give individual tours to different target groups um, in correspondence to their preferences or choices. And um, we intend to test uh, chatbots, like uh, what was mentioned before, the Anfrank house. Um, so far, what I have seen so far, I have to say, I think it's not working that well yet, but I think we're getting there. Um, there are also facets of AI. Uh, we have difficulties accepting. Jonathan mentioned it before. We ask ourselves the question, is it ethically correct to film show our survivors and to let a machine generated replica of a dead person answer questions on their behalf? Um, but anyway, um, I'm thrilled to be here um, and I hope to learn a lot more about this technology. I think it's one of the most fascinating, exponentially growing uh, technology and I think it is here to stay. And um, yeah, I'm happy to learn more about it. Thanks. Thank you, Barbara. Okay, and our last uh, speaker, Shimon. Um, hello, my name is Shimon Janota. I come here from a technology <coughs> company, Future Processing, in Silesia, in Poland. Uh, over 800 engineers, so not a startup, but rather a major company doing proper projects and uh, implement the projects which are being implemented, not just uh, things which are started to merge as an R&D project, as an idea or something. So that mat maturity uh, is something I would like to mention. Uh, AI itself is something we use in number of uh, projects, in number of solutions we are uh, building and providing. That mainly goes to uh, image analysis and video analysis, which we have expertise for over uh, 15 years uh, already. In areas like uh, medical imaging, uh, so things like uh, computer tomography images or uh, magnetic uh, resonance images and detecting uh, things like uh, automatically uh, without uh, human interaction detecting cancer in, in, in brain, in lungs, in, in, in other, other human organs. Uh, these are uh, fairly typical, I would say, and typical implementations of AI, of the most uh, sophisticated AI technologies uh, which are uh, emerging uh, in recent years, which goes down to deep learning and all the, all, all the ideas behind uh, self-driving cars, cars and, and, and all that. Uh, other implementations, uh, quality control on factory lines, uh, again, based on video cameras, you can detect that uh, some parts on the factory, factory line are broken and should be removed, replaced. That's, yeah, again, very major implementation of the uh, AI, uh, what AI can, it can achieve. Uh, analysis of public space in, uh, through CCTV cameras for detecting uh, some safety issues. Uh, again, that's something uh, what we are doing. 
analysis of uh, public space in uh, commercial areas, in museums, uh, detecting faces, seeing how people move around, uh, who they are, what are the statistics data uh, behind how uh, visitors, what visitors visit the, 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 the exhibitions, uh, what they do, how they move around, uh, what they look at the most, where they spend their time. Uh, it's all that uh, generates data which uh, can make ex exhibitions uh, closer to visitors, more directed, more, more personalized. It's not only about um, how many tickets were sold, it's more about how that ex exhibition fits uh, to the visitors. So uh, all of the things uh, I mentioned are not an um, idea, not a startup, are just uh, proper implementations which is something I would like to uh, underline because it's very easy to speak about um, ideas, right? That this is that great idea, the start up here, start up there, uh, start up there, uh, it, everything, can, everything can be started. But uh, it, as from, pers from a perspective of a major company, <coughs> I would say that the most problematic bit is get uh, that implementation in place and get, get it to produce some benefits that it's useful, that it has something which adds the, adds the value. So, yeah, I would uh, underwrite that side of uh, AI. We speak a lot about it, but uh, it's hard to get it uh, to the work and uh, give the value uh, to, the, to, the, to the end users. This is an important factor here. Yeah, thank okay, you. Thank you, Janusz. Okay, so we've uh, set the floor. We have the points for discussion, but uh, before we go further, I would like to have you to give you the chance for relax with a brief piece of music, okay? That okay, maestro. You said about uh, medical uh, applications for AI. Uh, you know there are uh, some uh, research that uh, suggests that uh, uh, the best optimal solution right now is uh, to have like uh, an AI and a doctor in a team, right? So like the AI is uh, very effective as on, on its own, obviously, which is great. Uh, uh, it's it's more efficient. Uh, uh, doctors are efficient in some other, deg uh, you know, um, degree. Uh, but when you combine AI and, and and doctor together, they are kind of ultimate team. And I guess it's the same for the curating, right? So, so the first, so the so, so the first applications uh, that I think I have, I see forward to. Uh, are the tools for curators that help them curating, not replacing them, mm -hmm. uh, and that's I think that the kind of the you know, the, the, um, the first applications that uh, we're going to show, uh, like to unveil. I just expect you know some apps for curators actually. Uh, I mean Google is doing that like uh, with some projects right with like this creating finding some uh, um, uh, unexpected connect connections with, with artworks etc uh, so I, I guess uh, that's on the field one of the fields that's that, uh, going to develop kind of rapidly you know just tools for creating better as a human being I think it, the, the, this is separate I think what curators do or what humans do with art I mean we're talking a lot about art as opposed to other types of objects but when curators they, they, they use their subjectivity, their opinions, their you know, philosophical or political positions. And I think that we'll always want something to be created by a human being. But when it comes to art, I think there are certain technical things that a machine could do, like you know, um, technical art history. So when they find a painting, they don't know if it's a Caravaggio. AI would be better at telling you than a human eye. However, we'll still need a human to explain the human value of it. And that's the difference, I think. Yeah, exactly. So, so again, it's like just team is like the optim optimal solution. You know, the both of the of of, of uh, best of the both worlds. Yeah, yeah. A number of you mentioned some uh, ethical concerns related to use of AI in in uh, cultural institutions. What what actually scares you? What makes you you know aware that there might be a problem? Um, I, I think it's in. There, there are ethical concerns with AI generally, just because it, we, we kind of we think of it as being neutral, but it's been designed by humans, and so you know it'd be surprising if it didn't reproduce the biases that humans have. But I think the danger is if you kind of transfer it to what seems impersonal, then you, it almost has more authority, as other people are saying. So I, th I think we need to we need to be aware that it all you know 
they're all, they're all human biases and they are. And in terms of, I think museums and other cultural institutions have a kind of ethical responsibility to address uh, issues in our society, you know, whether that's war or, you know, any other important issues. And so if you kind of defer that to an algorithm, they kind of abdication responsibility for, you know, for addressing these kind of issues. So I think that it's just something to be aware of. Yeah, it's, I think people come to museums because museums are seen, particularly um, social history museums and those types of museums, non-art museums, are seen as the um, guardians of truth and the guardians of facts and the guardians of history and heritage. And I think, Barbara, you hit, uh, hit the nail on the head when you said, we, we were talking about the same thing at IWM. We, um, at Imperial War Museums, we have a lot of um, people who live through the uh, first, uh, sorry, Second World War or took part in the Second World War and they come and give talks, but they're not going to be around for much longer. And we were talking about how do we preserve their stories when they can't tell it for themselves. And obviously a lot of, you know, there's a lot of creative and cultural projects being done with bots, Twitter bots, that essentially is just a back-end technology with a front put on, and that front could be a human being, a human personality, a front, you could script it. But the ethical implications of delivering something as if it was, you know, the, the, the ancient problem of mimesis, some, the, the, the representation standing in for the real thing, you know, it becomes very problematic when it's a human being, it's a personal story, or it's a, a story from the war, or a story from a, a, a museum like the Jewish Museum. I think there's a lot of potential for storytelling, um, but what happens when um, technology seems to be telling a fact when it may just be a subjective interpretation, and what happens when audiences are no longer to tell the difference between um, a fictional story and a human being or, or, or a fact or evidence. Um, I think that's where it's most exciting and interesting but most risky is there's lots of opportunities for telling the stories that museums have to tell in interactive ways, whether that be through Twitter bots, interactive documents, storytelling, or even in exhibitions, but the risk of people mistaking that for absolute fact and not judging it. When a human being tells you something, you think, why are they telling me? What is their, you know, what, where are they coming from? But Tony, but are, are there those are the human mistakes that often the curators or the museum guides, they, they commit the same, you know, the same sin, right? So what's the difference between AI doing that yeah. and the human being? The, the, the difference is that, that you know, the, the people are strongly believe that algorithm is, an, again, less, it's objective, you know, it's like a cold machine, you know, uh, uh, so they expect it to be uh, the truth. Uh, and, and it's actually been shown in, in some, some uh, uh, um, uh, research that uh, people are actually more willing to, um, to uh, trust machine than other human being in some, some cases. So, uh, so that, that's, that's, that's what was different. And, and then, uh, you know, also the reach of an algorithm is much bigger than one human being, you know, because if we have like one controversial curator, uh, you know, creating uh, his own uh, version of history, okay, that may well be, okay, he's he, some, in some country and, you know, probably he won't have that much influence to, you know, globally speaking. But uh, if we use algorithm, we can like reinforce some, you know, point of view, which is kind of disguised as a fact uh, to all the people around the world. And, you know, the scale of it, uh, technology generally, you know, most of the problems with technology is that uh, technology really helps to scale. Uh, it helps to scale, you know, good solutions, but also it helps to scale big problems. So that, that's a, a, a bit problematic, I guess. I think it's a, a question of authenticity. If you have testimonials um, and you film them and you have like 1,000 hours of film material and the machine is sorting the answers, because that is the, that is the goal, yeah? To be able like in 100 years to still ask questions, uh, the person can answer. The thing is, a person is very subjective and it's not objective at all. And if I ask the person in 100 years a question which you might not have even thought of today, because what, what do you know what, what will be in, in 100 years? The person cannot answer. It cannot answer with all of his memories and his feelings and he's always, he's also, um, you know, forgetting things and he, he, would, he would tell us a story he, in a totally different way than it happened because it is not a fact, but testimonials tell us we know that a lot of things are not true, are not a fact, but if you see a person then you can, you know, you can, uh, you, 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 can you know that. 
Um, if you have a machine, and then I totally agree with you, you think it is a fact, you think it is the true story, but then it's not, and it's just, it, 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 it has kind of a feeling of manipulation. On the other hand, of course, we also think like this is the last generation um, that can tell the story, so what are we going to do? We have to decide now, do we use the chance now to film them and, and, and do something with it, or, or do we say like, okay, this chapter is maybe closed and we have to find other ways of telling the story and, and keep the memory alive? Uh, AI in that uh, context, as you uh, just said, reminds me uh, statistics. Th there is a saying that uh, people, uh, like, I don't know, 95% of people tend to believe a sentence which refers to some uh, statistical data. Just need to say that uh, based on uh, scientists and uh, the investigation done over uh, 1,000 population, this is, this is something that doesn't have to be true, but people believe because it refers to, to the data. So AI in that context, uh, used in that way, would work this way, yeah, because that's how people work, just, just work and think, I think. But uh, the thing that a human is behind it, it's a good thing in the context of that uh, long-term AI which may appear and that uh, HAL 9000 from Space Odyssey or Terminator or all, the, all that safe self-thinking machines, self-thinking algorithms serving answers based on their own knowledge rather than knowledge uh, which, which, which human have. I much rather prefer the situation where humans are, are behind those tools rather than tools become their own uh, set true. Uh -huh. Yeah, so, uh, but another thing that, that kind of interests me personally is, uh, you know, um, some risks uh, in terms of uh, art itself. Uh, so not like cultural institutions, but like the, the object that they are, they are showing. Because uh, using uh, algorithms, as, as you probably know, this project uh, with Rembrandt, right? So they, they generally synthesize a new Rembrandt, uh, which looks like Rembrandt to the degree of like they, they actually uh, simulated the texture of, of the painting. Uh, so this was very, very uh, uh, convincing. Um, and then you think, okay, so now we can like potentially produce like thousands of those images like per day or I don't know, just how much technology ab uh, allows. And then is, isn't that like kind of some way inflating the value uh, of, 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 of the Rembrandt painting, you know, uh, because if we can like create artificial, let's say, art generator, which does the job as well as the masters, uh, you know, uh, from, from uh, history. Um, then we have this question of what's, wh wh where this value comes from, you know, because if it's, if it's painted as well as the original, then there's only this historic value, you know, this... Uh, I have thing. no problem with ruining artists' market value, that doesn't bother me at all. Oh. They're paid far too much. <laughs> <laughs> Yet, yeah. most contemporary artists are paid far too much and try and control guess, and inflate the value. What the problem is, and it's actually the same problem as with you know, the, the testimonials, if you were going to create a Twitter bot that was going to speak on behalf of Winston Churchill and did people know that this is just a bot's interpretation of what he might say or not, it's the same. The problem is not if you create things and people know, oh, that's an, it's a fictitious Rembrandt. It's just, do they know it's a fictitious Rembrandt or do they think it's a real Rembrandt? That's the problem. It's not the problem of it's changing the value. Culture needs to, values and cultures and, you know, change all the time. What we value, how we value it, you know, how we use things change all the time. And that should be allowed to run riot. That's the evolution of culture. What the problem becomes uh, when um, we don't know what's true, basically. You know, if, 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 our, if we create fictions and we, that we don't know are fictions, then we're living in a kind of a, uh, a web of But we can confusion. control that in the museum, you know, we can tell the people that uh, this is a machine. Yeah, but then you can make uh, confronted with, you know, some uh, auto-generated Rembrandt and it's so well generated that your algorithms that you're using to finding if it's an uh, original work or not may fail and you as a human being may fail, and then we have like this confusing situation when we know, really don't know anymore, you know, because uh, you, there's no way to tell that if it's, uh, if it's fake or if it's true, uh, because it's so well uh, generated by the algorithm, and you know, so yeah, that, that, that's, that's a problem, I guess. Um, but, but you know, in terms of faking the original, right, to me, 
it's, it's a clear issue of, of ethics, right? It's, it's just wrong. But I wanted to ask you a question about something else. If you you prejudiced mind. that. You Pardon? said faking. It's only faking yeah. if you try and pass it off as something real. If you're creating it, some, it's, you're doing something new. It's a totally new ontological activity. You right. know what I mean? That, that Rembrandt project. Yeah. If you don't know it, it's brilliant. The, the real Rembrandt or the new Rembrandt or something. Yeah, it's really Rembrandt. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll try to, to make one more attempt to play you some music and then I'll ask my question, all right? Okay, can you try? It was octet number one in D major, opus three, composed by Aiva. And uh, it's part of the new release called Genesis. And Aiva is uh, artificial intelligent virtual artist. This is the software fed with dozens of dozens of classical composition and it's composing by its own original pieces, which by the way, sell just perfectly. They are used as a soundtracks for the movies, for the commercial video games. Mm -hmm. So it's not copying, it's just creating the new stuff yep. by learning. How do you feel when the stage is shared by the living artists and the artificial intelligence? Yeah, so so that, that's you know, what, what I wanted to brought in terms of like paintings, right? Uh, because here we have a situation uh, which is like, you know, it's a genuine, genuine like, piece of art uh, created autonomously by machine uh, and that, in fact, somewhat, uh, uh, you know, devaluates the effort of a human being, you know, studying as to become a composer and kind of devaluates, you know, uh, all that we uh, value in art, uh, like it's unique, unique, that it's kind of unique, you know, uh, that it involves some human being uh, putting some effort into it. Uh, so, I don't know, uh, we can like, you know, uh, cherish, you know, uh, Mozart, for example, you know, but th does it really make sense anymore when you can like create symphony that sounds like it's on like just a click of a button? You know, it's like, so, so that might, might be a problem because then he's just like a his, historic figure, we, we, you know, it's like he's not so outstanding uh, compared with what machines can create just like in a few seconds, for example. Yeah, but on the other hand, art is about my experience as a recipient, right? So I can enjoy this music very much. I can enjoy the, you know, artificially generated paintings, yeah, exactly. which also came to show. Okay, so do you, do you feel, I don't know, it's unfair or it's not of that value as human produced art? Absolutely not. And that's a problem for, for actual human beings, you know? Uh, because that really devaluates uh, what's unique about art created by humans in some way. And don't, don't you think that uh, an artist is something uh, extra to, 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 to the work itself? It's yeah. yeah, obviously. Uh, when I was uh, thinking about uh, this panel today, uh, I uh, yeah, obviously uh, end up with that uh, automatically generated music, and I uh, thought to, to myself that uh, would, would I... I don't see a big comparison uh, and, and 
um, AI entering the stage and the public around it listening to that and looking at that AI thing which now just plays a concert. It just doesn't work like that. An artist, there is something. Uh, I mean, you can like put the robots there, e exactly. and then you have I like, like the life experience. It's we. I know it's not like we, we, we'll hear. I mean, it's like not that uh, you know far from the future. Uh, in the future, like this, you can very much uh, kind of imagine the concert that is played by machines, uh, the robots on the stage live that was composed by the artificial intelligence. You have live performers. You have like this, uh, you know, uh, live event. So it's like getting you know almost like. Like the real thing. For, for, for me, it's like a museum online and museum in, in real life. You can you see the same thing, but it's still different. But yeah, the only difference here is like the human effort. So I think we're, I think okay, we're hold on, hold on, Barbara was first. Okay, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I exactly wanted to say that. Two weeks ago, we had a, um, the opening of a new uh, museum in Berlin, and they had a cool stage with three robots playing heavy metal. I think it was really quite cool. Um, I mean, I can show a video um, because it, it, I think it's totally, it's totally fine. Yeah, it's a new, a new player in the market, so to say. And I think, um, and, and I think that's, that's totally fine. It's the same with um, machines writing articles now with the Washington Post. I think, but there it's, it's a little different because as far as I know, they, um, they wrote the articles that the journalists didn't want to write. So the, the basic stuff and then the journalists have more time to do like the most interesting documentaries and, 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 and reports. So I think that's totally fine actually. I don't have a problem with that. By the way, you know, this music we've heard was played by the live symphonic orchestra. The, just the music was composed by the software. I think the issue is, is about, yeah, like you were saying about originality. You know, when, when Mozart was, was alive and he was writing, his, his works were genuinely original. And then once, he, once he's done that, it's easy for a less talented composer to imitate that and also for an, an algorithm to imitate that. But I think, I think there's, like you're saying with journalism, some, some things are routine and you can, an algorithm can learn how to do that, but to do something genuinely original. I still, I still think it's going to be hard for an algorithm to learn uh, how to do that. Yeah, but there, there is something like genuine originality really exists. I mean, we were just like machines. We are just learning and we're just copying, uh, you know, uh, other artists and other writers uh, by in the process of learning. So it's all like imitation game, you know? But uh, I think, I think a lot, sorry, I think a lot of it is, but then there, there, every so often there are really original artists or musicians or creators who do something totally unexpected and they can do all the stuff that other people are doing and then they just add a bit of their own. I, don't, I'm, I just wonder whether an algorithm will ever be able to, to add that kind of... That's a question. Right. I can't no, agree no, with no, you, no. what you're saying. I, uh, without getting really philosophical into the, <laughs> into the what is art, what do we value kind of stuff, you know, Shostakovich wrote um, his Fifth Symphony in a very specific historical time and it was a gesture to do that music at that time. You know, no, don't tell them I said this, the Rolling Stones, not the best musicians in the world, but they're the biggest rock band in the world. You know, that's not about technical talent, it's about making, you know, they made rock and roll music in the 60s in a particular way that nobody else was doing. It wasn't about technical skill and forgetting about originality, it was the fact that it was the, the right gesture, the right uh, yeah, mood the right human values and, and, and a specific part of human history that's always going to be human so whether it be an artificial intelligence composing something whether it be an AI robotic rock band they're just going to be tools put in place by a human and they'll be good or they'll be rubbish depending on what humans value at the time yeah I, I, I guess you're right basically and, and but again uh, it's uh, you know uh, I think uh, another factor we have to like uh, take account here is like uh, something called the skilling. So, um, as you said, we may use these algorithms to help us create. Uh, and uh, using some algorithms that help actually help to compose music, you know, really lowers the bar for the entrance to being a composer. So, uh, like, like, no, it's like um, all the smartphones and, and filters, etc., made all of us photographers, right? Uh, we're not producing a better photography because of that, obviously. Uh, but what's interesting in terms of like, you know, uh, social impact of AI also in like creative space uh, is like the skilling, you know, things that some time ago needed like very uh, long, uh, you know, a learning process. Uh, they were very hard, uh, hard to achieve. Now are getting easier because you have those tools that help you actually compose the music, help you paint paintings, etc. And that again makes you know that 
this inflation of, of creative output of, of human beings, which might be problematic, you know, as it is right now, actually. That was my, my you know, thought that uh, I, I don't feel that uh, AI is only a tool in the hands of the real artist. This music, for me, is one of the examples that the, the AI could be artist itself, actually. The, the issue is about the value of that art, because I can easily imagine, as with food, you can have a popular cheap food and popular cheap art, which is, you know, machine produced, which is nice, which is, you know, gets to your heart and it raises emotions. And you have some elite human produced art, you know, as, a, as the other, other field of, of interest and activity. Yeah, but, you know, AI could do this, but AI won't necessarily want to do this. I mean, like, there's no agenda, you know, behind this algorithm. So that, that's, that's, you know, the thing you referred to. That's, obviously, you can, like, the AI could potentially create a piece, but the human being is the one decides that it's going to be created, right? Someone clicked the button. Someone, like, recorded the piece uh, in the end. So, uh, so, so that, that's the main difference, you know? Yeah, okay. like you, you know, what's your, why you want to do Something, okay, really. so it's, it's not autonomous enough to be the artist by itself, right? Is this your conclusion? Yeah, yeah, because, because it, you know, it's not because it cannot be want to be artist because there is no, nothing that want, really right. could want something, you know. Okay, so uh, you, you, but, you will it, like but will it be? That is a question. I mean, will artificial intelligence develop in a way that at a certain point it does want things? Well, that's, that's an open question. It, it, it's not answered yet. And very good debate. Uh, even very recently, uh, Vladimir Putin raised something on, on, on the news that they will fight with AI or, or, or whatever. But being, building that AI with, where it will be standalone and do things on its own, this is the, the, the scary future. And hopefully we won't reach that yeah. point. Because you know, there are two things here. It's like two types of AI, actually. You know, there's a strong AI, that's what, what Putin was talking about and Elon Musk is talking about, etc., which is kind of unlikely, I guess, you know, because it's an AI that's really kind of simulating a like, human being with uh, you know, all desires, you know, all agenda, etc. Yes. And I don't know if, we, if that's going to happen ever. We don't know, we really don't know. But then there's a, a layer of like this like, weak AI, let's say, which are very domain-specific tools, actually. You know, the AI could compose music, but uh, it won't necessarily uh, have a uh, skill to, uh, to talk with people about the music it creates, right? <laughs> so, um, so it's very, very domain-specific uh, applications uh, using AI. It's a totally different thing than strong AI, like in Terminator or whatever. Yeah. Uh, simple example, uh, that music was uh, composed based on other music. So that machine world was learned with existing music, produced by, by humans, basically, and then produced uh, something similar. So it took uh, one bit from here, one bit from here, mixed it. Like a human being, uh, actually, right? To some extent. <laughs> oh, have, have you heard of the, there's a, um, the UC Berkeley American academic called Hubert Dreyfus? He wrote in the 70s a book called What Computers Can't Do, and he republished it in the 90s called What Computers Still Can't Do. <laughs> He's been the kind of scourge of the AI community. He's a philosopher. Um, he's not saying that AI isn't a wonderful and amazing and exciting thing. What he's seeing is all this talk of um, AI are going to be humans, are going to be beings in the way that we are beings is rubbish. It's, a, it's, a, yeah. it's not a technological, we'll never get there or we're not there yet. It's an absolute fundamental impossibility. He's saying it's a categorical, it can't be. And he, there's a, there was a great film made a few years ago called um, Being in the World about this guy's work. It's because this Hubert Dreyfus pulls a lot of ideas from Martin Heidegger, the German philosopher who wrote famously Being in Time. I recommend you all watch a brilliant documentary. Um, but he, what he talks about, and this relates both to our conversation about art, but also our sort of ethical conundrum about a bot that tried to pretend to be human. He's, this documentary, and it talks about Hubert Dreyfus' work in that book, um, they talk about hu what does it mean to be a human? For example, if I ask you a question like, what do you care about? How do you answer that? It's a million different things, you know. Or for example, there's a great one in the book where a philosopher stands up and he, and he uh, has a feather in one hand and a, I don't know, uh, a book in another hand and he drops them. And the book obviously goes, and the feather does that. He said, we all knew 
the feather would take longer to hit the ground. How many things like that do you know? And then when you add the value on top of that, why do you give a shit about stuff? How do you answer that? And then when you add the fact that this kind of consciousness, that we give a shit for no reason or for complex reasons, how many in million different things do we know and prioritize for different reasons? And we do that in a lived body, you know? He talks about, um, if you ask a baseball player, you throw a ball at a baseball player, does that, he said, how do you do that? You can't teach someone to do that. You have to feel it, you have to learn it, you have to try it. Mm -hmm. Ask a Japanese carpenter how he does it, it's a sensual thing. That's the difference. He said you can train an AI to do kind of empirical, mathematical things, and it can do them really well, and it can simulate certain different parts of what okay. human is, but it can't so I, I give think a shit. We, we stick with this conclusion because we are also biased because we don't want to lose our jobs as a curators, artists, journalists, etc. Right? Okay. So you know, AI will never replace us. Actually. Okay, since uh, we are slowly coming to an end, I think it's a time for, for the questions uh, from you. Uh, please raise your hands. Okay, I will come to you with a microphone. Okay, so first over here. I've got a very simple and thing, a short question with a short answer, I hope. Uh, what's the copyright status of uh, AI-generated content? What's the, the copyright status of this piece of music? Who knows? Uh, I don't know, but I can make educated guess that you know probably the creator of the algorithm uh, is also the copyright holder for what the output of this algorithm is. Uh, I guess that's the most probably straightforward uh, thing. Uh, it, it, it's about uh, software licensing. Sorry, and, uh, software software licensing, and it's a huge huge subject by itself. Sure. Uh, like. Um, Word, uh, Word application. Microsoft licenses you the uh, Microsoft Word. You write document in it. Basing on the license, uh, you own the content you wrote there. So uh, the same is with the AI. Depends on the tool. So uh, some company created it, and some company that company sells it or gives it or or whatever. Based yeah, on but some it's license. it's uh, it's a tool. Yeah, it's an, uh, a mm -hmm. program. Let's say. But uh, yeah. then what about because if. Of course, you used, uh, I know, uh, MS Office to write a novel. Then, of mm -hmm. course, you are the copyright owner of the novel. But then, okay, you, uh, you write an algorithm and a program, and then you sell it to, to compose mm -hmm. AI music, yeah? But yes. then, who is the copyright owner of this piece? Is it's, it the company it's, it's, or...? It's, it's the same uh, as with uh, Microsoft Word. Okay. It's just the huge difference on the complication of those tools, which makes some confusion, but okay, it's the same. Shimon, so actually the, the only response is it depends. Yes, it depends on the details of the, of the copyrights of the software, of the owner, of the licensing. Okay, another question, please. Uh, hi, I would like to ask you about uh, artificial intelligence and cultural institutions. Uh, my point of view is a point of view of a viewer, of audience. Um, what about the question of uh, privacy? Why is the right a museum to, uh, to know me as a viewer, as an audience, uh, to know my uh, emotions, uh, age, and other uh, data? It's more important that uh, me, my right to uh, stay alone with I and I, with, with art, for example, uh, in museum, uh, as I consider it as my uh, human right, right? Mm -hmm. It's personal. And uh, why is it so important that museum has to offer me something, learn me something, much more than I as a human being can uh, imagine and can choose as my own? Well, okay, uh, thank you. Yes, that's a question. Thank you. Yeah, that's an important issue. How do you respond to that? Well, well, I think it's very important that the visitor can choose, yeah? If you don't want these kind of offers, you don't have to use them. Of course not. I mean, we cannot. Uh, convince you and we don't want to so you can have your own experience in whatever way you want but we know that there are users that um, um, whose experience we can improve using these tools and that's that's all we want to offer so for us it's really like um, we have different ways um, and different offers I would say exactly the same it's people were not outraged when fa because fa Facebook were taking lots of data without you knowing or taking a photo they were outraged that they didn't ask you 
You know, if you can opt out of it, then fine. You know, that's the problem. So it's only yes people. And my only other thing to say would be, if it can create a unique experience that genuinely helps a particular audience or a particular person, then why not do it as long as it's an option? I mean, that might be digitally in terms of, you know, tailoring a website to someone's needs or interest, making that easier, if you can choose that. Or it might be something really, really creative, like, you know, I don't know if you've... I'm working a lot with theatre at the moment in the museum space, an immersive theatre. Now, if you know a little bit about a person, you can craft an experience which is more powerful, more interesting, more um, impactful for that person. As long as the person knows you're doing that, I don't see that as an ethical problem, but you have to just ask. All right, thank you. Are there any other questions? Please raise your hands. Okay, anybody? Okay, if not, so I think it's a time to sum up our discussion. Um, since we touched plenty of topics and issues, I think we also end the session with the number of voices. So I'll ask you for a brief comment or the question or concern. It's yes, like, like one minute each to sum up your thoughts, your questions, your you know, remarks for the future of our, our guests. Okay, maybe this time starting with Shimon. Um, I, Okay, my comment would be uh, AI is a tool at the moment and we shouldn't worry about it. It's, it's new uh, in the same way like internet was new at some point in, in time, in the same way like computers were new at some point of time. And it's emerging, it will appear in a number of places, in museums, in uh, everywhere basically. We just need to get used to it and, and, and use it. And hopefully we won't look too far ahead to get that uh, strong AI. Okay, thank you, Barbara. I would like to emphasize what I said in the beginning. Um, for me, AI is just one of the tools, one of technologies we should really think of using. And especially in these times, I think it's so important to tell our story. For me now personally, with the Jewish Museum, you might have heard that we had elections in Germany um, on Sunday. And for the first time since 45, we have a very right-wing party in our parliament again. And it's even more important to tell our story and if artificial intelligence or any other technology can help us, then why not using it? Why not testing it? So I think we should be really open and we can also come to the conclusion that we might not use it. It's not, it's not, you know, it's not a must, but um, we want to have every option on the table. Okay. Thank you, Jakub. So I think AI is not just a tool, actually, uh, and uh, that requires uh, special attention uh, in using that, uh, uh, especially in large scale uh, and in public institutions uh, and, and uh, huge companies, etc. So we should pay extra attention. Uh, we are in a, in a moment when we uh, should learn uh, really kind of uh, from our mistakes, you know, made previous, with previous technologies, uh, with previous media, and try to uh, apply this knowledge to artificial intelligence just uh, uh, to, uh, to use it effectively and uh, harmlessly. Yeah. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I, th I think we were talking a lot uh, just now about using visitor data and analyzing it. I think possibly the more important area will be collections data. And that's what makes museums and libraries unique is that they have these massive collections which, which no, no one person can comprehend. And I think that's, that's where artificial intelligence has a lot of potential in helping people understand those. And I think to do that, um, institutions are going to have to work together probably because they kind of, you know, related items are shared across so many different collections. But I think it's a big opportunity for cultural institutions. Okay, thank you. Tony? Uh, I think the whole conversation was starting with, isn't AI exciting, what can we do with it? And that's probably the wrong way around. I think we should always start with, what problem or creative problem do I want to solve, and is this the right solution? So that might be, how do I organize my website? That might be, how do I translate my website? That might be uh, a whole other range of things, and AI might be the solution. One area that I think AI could help me in what I'm doing at the moment, I'm doing a lot of stuff with live theater in museums and cultural institutions, um, and the reason for doing stuff with live actors or live performers is they can live respond to your audience. The problem with that is that it's not very sustainable. You have to pay actors, you know, and it's very hard to keep things going for a long time, whereas an exhibition or an interactive display can just be there. If um, an, a bot or an automated experience 
could live respond uniquely to individual visitors, you can then do something more creative, more sustainable. So my last plug will be, I'm doing a project called Playcraft Live that you can all watch live online on the 14th of October. It's the first um, live play to be delivered inside of a video game online. Um, and it's going to be live digital puppeteers. Um, uh, go to the website, check it out. I'll know if you've watched it because I've inserted a bot into all your phones whilst you've been watching this uh, talk. Joking. Um, but uh, we're thinking about how we take that project to the next step. And obviously we can't have us puppeteers puppeteering that all the time. But if those avatars inside of the video game could live interact with our audience, then we'd have a live play for everyone all of the time. So just to leave that thought with you. Okay, so thank you very much. We are leaving you with these comments, recommendations, invitations, etc. Because, you know, AI will be our, you know, common day and our surrounding more and more often, even in the museums and in galleries, music halls, etc. So I hope uh, you will remember our session a few years from now, you know, being surrounded entirely by artificial intelligence, but not by artificial curators and artists. Thank you very much. It's time for our break. I'm closing our session.